Hello, everyone. Coach Hurst here. The cafe is open for business, and I'm happy to be back. The first training cafe of 2023. Um, just want to make sure I have audio here. Can someone just give me a thumbs up or a yes uh, comment just to let me know uh, you're hearing me? And uh, also the comments box is where later on in this cafe you can type in a brief question and I'll try to give you a brief pointed actionable answer. Uh, today's topic of the day is uh, running and climbing. Is there any value to do some running uh, aerobic training as part of your training for climbing program? And as with many training questions I get asked, the answer is it depends. Uh, so I'm going to talk five or ten minutes about that and give you some uh, evidence-based uh, guidance on aerobic training for climbing, and uh, then I'll get to your questions in just a bit. And it looks like Fred says the sound is good, so thank you, Fred, for the heads up on that. Now, I don't have my typical attire on because I literally just finished my morning workout about five minutes ago. I still have chalk in my hands. You see I have uh, some flesh-colored tape on my finger because I have a little bit of knuckle pain, uh, old guy stuff, uh, you know, pre-arthritis or maybe, you know, some mild arthritis beginning to develop. Uh, so, um, and uh, ironically, my morning workout uh, today was a climbing specific aerobic workout. So therein lies um, a little bit of a sense of what I'm going to be telling you, that there is uh, some value uh, at least in climbing specific aerobic training. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you a bit about protocols. I mean, I can go down a deep rabbit hole on energy system training and we would be here for hours and some of you would enjoy that. <laughs> but uh, I wanna keep this uh, episode of the cafe uh, not too uh, long-winded. And uh, you know, I have actually a second workout of the day that I will do this evening. And just to give you a little bit of insight into what I'm doing yesterday, I did a max strength workout, fairly brief. I did some uh, hangboard, a, th a thorough warm up, some weighted hangs, a little bit of campusing, just a dash of campusing. Uh, you know, of course, all training has to be very personalized and appropriate for your age and background and injury history and all that stuff. Uh, and so that was yesterday morning. I rested uh, the, the next 24 hours. Then this morning, I just finished up my. Uh, first workout of the day, which was a climbing specific uh, aerobic session. Uh, and then this evening, I'm going to do a very brief anaerobic, you know, lactic training session, which will be uh, just some one minute all out intervals on the tread wall with uh, five minutes of rest in between. And I'll just do about a half a dozen of those. Um, so uh, that'll be very specific to the lactic system. This morning's workout was very specific to the aerobic energy system. And you see, I'm still. Uh, not pumped, uh, you know, the aerobic workouts, if they're done right, shouldn't be overly pumpy. Uh, you should uh, get the blood flowing and, you know, certainly fully perfuse the climbing specific muscles. Uh, but if you get massively pumped and, uh, of course, climb to failure, well, then it's a lactic session more than it is uh, an aerobic training session. So, um, you know, Enough with that, I guess. Let's move forward here. And by the way, we didn't do our toast. Our, usually we uh, hold up, or I hold up a coffee mug and we sip coffee together as climbers around the world unite here in the training cafe. Today, I'm actually sipping some uh, strawberry blast weapons grade whey protein by Fizzy Vantage, climbing specific nutrition. And the strawberry blast is my favorite. Um, I developed it, so if it's not my favorite, I would blame myself. Uh, but post-workout, not the coffee. That's not the way to go. It's the whey protein. So let's uh, hold up your beverage of choice. Perhaps it's coffee. And let's uh, sip together. Climbers unite. And in case you're wondering, uh, I put a scoop of the weapons-grade whey into um, just a third of a cup of uh, oat milk. And then I fill up another like two thirds of a cup uh, equivalent of water. Uh, so it's very diluted oat milk. And then I put the scoop of weapons grade whey, which is uh, whey isolated. It's very, um, pretty much darn near 100% protein, about 21 grams of protein per scoop, little extra calories. So this whole 
serving that I just drank was about 150 calories, but had about 23, 24, 25 grams of protein. I guess the oat milk has a tiny bit of protein in it. Uh, so a good post-workout protein feeding. I'll have a little bit of carbohydrate uh, when I'm done with the training cafe, get myself kind of refueled, recovered. I'll have a six hour break after my morning workout. And then that'll set me up, kind of, you know, get my whole body to reset for a different energy system to be trained this evening with my brief lactic session. Okay, so uh, let's talk about running and climbing. Is there value at all? And first of all, a disclaimer, if you're relatively new to climbing, then the best training for climbing is to go climbing. So you wanna to go to the gym, you wanna to go to the crags, you wanna climb with experienced folks who you can learn techniques and tactics. Uh, you know, it's all about uh, experience, you know, learning the skills, uh, developing the mental skills, which, you know, that mental domain is so critical and it holds a lot of people back as they get into lead climbing or, or bouldering outside. Uh, you know, so the first few years should be more about that kind of stuff and less about uh, intensive training, though some dabbling in training is appropriate. And if you, know, if you get into climbing and you're uh, a bit overweight or perhaps obese, well then doing some training and some uh, nutritional modifications to uh, reduce body fat would be a very prudent thing early on too, because extra weight is obviously something you have to lift off the ground as you climb. And uh, it's also uh, extra weight is harder on your joints and tendons. And so there's multiple reasons to uh, seek to have kind of an optimal uh, body composition. You know, you don't need to be crazy skinny. Uh, you know, if you're malnourished, that would have many uh, problems as well. Uh, but that's a separate topic uh, uh, for another episode. Um, okay, so there's the disclaimer is, you know, climbing is the most important thing to do. Now, as you become more advanced, you advance in ability, then that does open the door to uh, finding ways to uh, e expand and develop your physical capabilities. That would be finger strength, pulling strength, you know, antagonist muscle strength, shoulder strength, very important uh, you know, uh, for injury resistance and for steep climbing, core strength, Strength through your posterior chain is important. Uh, it creates stiffness for us, especially on steeper routes. And you know, body position and stiffness is very critical to conserving energy when you're on uh, steeper climbs. And so, uh, you know, as you become intermediate, advanced, elite, more and more time is spent training. Of course, it needs to be effective training, and that's the challenge many climbers face: is that you know, what is the best training for program for you? Well, it's different than the guy next to you here, and it's different than the guy next to you here. It's gotta be personalized and appropriate. Um, it's gotta, you know, uh, target your weaknesses that are holding you back, those limiting constraints physiologically. And uh, that's where the guidance of uh, an experienced coach, a veteran coach can be quite helpful. Um, and, you know, to some degree, gathering information yourself and trying to self-coach you know, becoming self-aware and being able to self-analyze your climbing and your strengths and weaknesses, and then use all that information, and try to tool the best program for you. And, you know, for many climbers, that's a lifelong journey. It has been for me. Uh, you know, I'm still involved uh, in constantly kind of retooling my program to be age appropriate, goal appropriate. You know, uh, this um, is, I've been climbing 45 years, and I've been coaching climbing for most of those years, uh, 35, let's say, of those years, and, uh, you know, being involved in the research and learning the science and, you know, doing my own research, and, you know, so I have a lot of um, experience uh, that I'm happy to share with you through my books, podcasts, and here on the Training Cafe. Uh, so when it comes to running per se, um, it's pretty far down the list on things that I would have uh, um, you know, if I was laying out a program and kind of a hierarchy of important things for somebody who's ready for some physical training, you know, running would not be number one on the list. Uh, you know, doing some finger training, doing some antagonist muscle training, doing some core training, you know, doing some, uh, you know, uh, system wall training, you know, things that are very climbing specific would be what the bulk of the program is about. That being said, there is some value in uh, developing your cardiovascular system, not only for health and longevity, but also for climbing performance, especially if your interests are longer boulders or routes. Uh, 
climbs that take longer than a minute of sustained, vigorous climbing are actually more aerobic than they are anaerobic. Now, those very hardest moves, whether they're on a long route or on a short boulder, those very hardest moves where you're bearing down and trying basically near 100%, you are anaerobic at that point. It's you know the alactic system, and if it's a sustained hard sequence, you'll become lactic, the anaerobic lactic system, which is when your muscles start to burn and get pumped. Uh, and those two energy systems, uh, you know, contribute to ATP production and your power output in the first 10 to 30 seconds, and then the aerobic system starts to contribute more and more, and by one minute the ATP is being generated generally more by the aerobic energy system in the stressed muscles than by the lactic system because the lactic system is, is finite. That's why we talk about an anaerobic reserve. Once that reserve is tapped, once your muscles become uh, quite acidic, the pH drops inside the cells, uh, your brain shuts you down. You know, it's a self-preservation thing. And through proper training, you can train up that anaerobic system to some degree, but it can't be trained up forever. And that is why uh, you really, as a climber, need to be training all three energy systems. The exception being, if you are someone that just system walls, you know, I think the typical system wall route is less than 30 seconds of climbing. Uh, if you just system wall, if you just campus board, that's what you do for fun, uh, which takes five seconds, uh, typically on a campus board, uh, you know, those are primarily anaerobic activities. The aerobic system contributes a little bit while you're climbing in those situations, but it mostly uh, is involved, I mean, recovery between system wall routes, between campus board, uh, you know, runs. The recovery is all aerobic, but if that recovery is not being rushed, you know, typically if you're campusing for training or if you're system boarding, for limit training, you're taking lots of rest. So the aerobic system has time to kind of slowly recover um, and uh, you know, drive that recovery process, I should say, for the anaerobic systems through various mechanisms I won't get into here. But it is the aerobic system that uh, does drive recovery. So uh, you, know, you, you can argue that if you are someone that is involved in bouldering competitions where you have very limited rest periods, like you have to rest 30 or 60 seconds and then give the boulder another try, well then having a stronger aerobic system would be helpful because it would help you recover faster. But if you're bouldering outdoors and your recovery is kind of unlimited and you rest a lot between attempts, between boulders, well then your aerobic system's not really being all that stressed. Um, now, as soon as you go to longer boulders or climbs where you're, you know, you know, climbing, engaging the climbing muscles at, you know, variable intensities, but, you know, I, if you're climbing at your limit on a route, you're doing probably a fair amount of crux moves where you're trying. You're not just uh, cruising easy terrain. Uh, so all three energy systems are involved, obviously, but primarily, the, you know, the bulk, probably 80% of the uh, ATP production is the aerobic energy system. And so it's in this setting where that climbing specific aerobic system, uh, you know, how much oxygen you can get through your climbing muscles, uh, how effective the mitochondria are at making ATP. In fact, the mitochondria mass, how much mitochondria content is one of the critical adaptations you're after if you're gonna do long boulders and routes. Uh, you know, the capillary density in your climbing muscles is very, very important. And those are adaptations that take months and years to develop. And so uh, having um, some kind of base aerobic training, again, mostly climbing specific aerobic training year round, I think is important if you're a route climber. Uh, whereas again, if you're a boulder, it's not uh, you know, uh, that critical and perhaps not necessary at all. Um, so uh, I guess, the final distinction I want to make is the angle at which you climb. If you mostly climb vertical routes where you're standing on your feet uh, and you know, can rest more readily perhaps, uh, and your strong leg muscles or you're standing on straight legs, your bones are supporting your weight, then there's lots of time for the other muscles, your core, your shoulders, your climbing muscles to 
relax and allow blood flow and to you know, drive recovery. Um, and that is markedly different than being on a steep route where more of the weight is on your hands and your fingers than it is on your feet. Uh, and so that's where obviously body weight is a bigger factor on steep routes. A speed of climbing is a bigger factor on s steep routes. And your climbing specific VO2 is more and more important as you get on harder, steeper, longer routes. And I would posit that the best steep route sport climbers, you know, Andra, Megos, uh, Seb, uh, uh, certainly has been hot, Jakob, uh, you know, those types of people, Seagrist, uh, you know, here in America, uh, have, whether they know it or not, a very high climbing specific VO2 max. Uh, and you know, VO2 max is something that uh, is you know, generally talked about in the context of runners uh, you know, the, or swimmers or bikers, you know, those cyclic leg driven activities uh, where you know, your big muscles of your body are consuming a lot of oxygen to make ATP to fuel long runs, long bikes. Um, long swimming, long cross-country skiing, you know, but they're all leg-oriented activities. And so the typical VO2 max test, if you went to a university or a research facility and got one, is they would put you on a treadmill, they'd put on a mask, you know, a gas analyzer mask, and they would have you run at increasingly difficult speed to failure over the course of, you know, 10 or 20 minutes. You know, there's different protocols. Uh, and th their computers would then analyze the gases, uh, you know, and how much oxygen you consume, and they would calculate your VO2 max. Uh, and, you know, the very best, let's say, marathoners or uh, swimmers or bike racers have, cr you know, crazy VO2 maxes, you know, up, you know, upper 70s into the 80s. Um, I'm sure some elite alpine climbers have VO2 maxes, uh, you know, because th th that's a leg-driven sport at altitude. So they have to be able to consume a lot of oxygen as well, uh, especially in an oxygen-limited environment of alpine climbing. But in any case, those crazy high values of VO2 are because through years of training and perhaps genetics, likely genetics, uh, they, those athletes uh, developed a very high capillary densi density in their leg muscles, uh, high mitochondria content uh, in their muscles and a very strong cardiorespiratory system in terms of their heart strength, the stroke volume of the heart, how much blood can be pushed through your system with every beat, uh, and uh, how much oxygen can move in and out of your uh, blood through the lungs. All those factors uh, are trainable long term that develop this VO2, again, that is generally measured in those leg uh, athlete type sports. And so plunking a climber onto a treadmill is kind of a stupid thing to do. You could you know, do that test and you can calculate their VO2 in that test, but it wouldn't be a climbing specific VO2 because they're not using their climbing muscles. They're using their leg muscles. They're running on a treadmill, just like all the other athletes. And that's been done and climbers are very ordinary when it comes to that type of VO2 test, typically in the 50s. Um, and, uh, you know, so that test doesn't very well discern one climber from another because it's not climbing specific in any way. But if we uh, did that same test on a treadmill, or, or a tread wall, I should say, a tread wall that's overhanging, that would simulate hard, you know, elite level climbing where, you know, you're all your muscles of your body are working on those steep routes, right? From your finger flexors to your pulling muscles, your core is constantly working on those steep routes. Uh, you know, to some degree, your posterior chain and legs are contributing to propel you and to create stiffness. So all of those muscles uh, combined are going to consume a lot of oxygen. And therein lies uh, the reason that uh, aerobic training is important for uh, climbers especially if they specialize in the steeper routes that last longer than a minute, and especially the really, like, think of Adam Andra on silence. He was on the route for 20 minutes. Or Seb on, you know, his massively long routes, probably an hour or more. I don't know what the, the length of time is, but it's a long time. He's consuming a ton of oxygen through that period. 
Uh, and of course, there's rest on those routes where you're knee bar and you're doing whatever, uh, where the aerobic energy system is, is helping cleanse and refill the lactic system. And so uh, the aerobic system is important to generate ATP as you climb, but also to drive recovery when you're at one of those rest positions. And so kind of the bottom line is, um, from a research perspective, we need to develop, uh, and I don't know of anybody who's done it extensively, but a VO2 test that's climbing specific on a tread wall that could be standardized. And that's very hard to do because, you know, just whether you turn your hips on that steep tread wall or climb neutral on that steep tread wall, it's going to affect the efficacy. Whereas, you know, running on a treadmill is basically running on a treadmill. So uh, as with much of the climbing research out there, it's very tough to clean out all the variables and m get meaningful results. I, I know um, a, a colleague of mine, um, a, a sadly deceased just in the past couple of weeks, Dr. Phil Watts uh, from uh, Northern Michigan University, you know, one of the first climbing researchers, you know, 20, 25 years ago, he began doing climbing research and is really the father of climbing specific research, at least here in North America. Uh, he was a mentor of mine, and he did a, a, a climbing VO2 test 15 years ago, but it was on a vertical wall. So he kind of found what you would expect is that climbing on a vertical wall where you're standing on your feet was not all that stressful for the aerobic energy system, and he found very ordinary VO2 values. Uh, but again, putting it on a steep wall and then standardizing it and uh, collecting the data when a climber is really working hard from finger to toe I think the, the data would be very, very different, and we would find that the elite climbers, uh, you know, that are climbing those steep 514, 515 routes, have uh, a higher climbing specific VO2 than lesser climbers climbing steep routes. Uh, so, uh, so again, I, in my opinion, training the aerobic energy system is important, uh, though. It has to be, to be most effective to aid your climbing, it needs to be climbing specific aerobic training. Um, and just a small amount of generalized aerobic training. And you know, generalized aerobic training is me going out for a run, which I did yesterday. You know, I got for a three mile run, you know, at a you know, zone two cardio pace, eight minute miles, whatever. Um, doing that two or three days a week will give me some modest adaptions of the cardiovascular system, the stroke volume of your heart, which I think is a, a valuable um, uh, thing for climbers to train to adapt because if you're at a rest, a brief rest, and you can only stay there for 30 seconds, well, the more blood you can push through your body and through your forearms, through your climbing muscles in 30 seconds, the more you will recover. And so the stronger the stroke volume, uh, you know, the more blood each bead of your heart can push through your body, the more recovery you'll get in your forearms. And actually, that is research that was done by uh, Volker Schofel and his colleagues in Germany about a decade ago. He found that climbers that did some generalized aerobic training, like running a few days a week, uh, recovered faster between routes and while on routes. Uh, so that, that's, that's been shown quite nicely in climbing research with you know, higher level climbers. Um, and I, it's probably, you know, he's a German researcher, a German physician, and I know a lot of the German climbers do their running. You know, they've learned from their, uh, the researchers in their country. And uh, so uh, if you're a route climber, you probably want to do a little bit of generalized aerobic training, you know, not marathon training or anything crazy like that, but enough to get some of that generalized aerobic system adaptations. And then uh, two climbing specific aerobic sessions per week, which should be sub-maximal, kind of zone two climbing, if we can use that terminology, where if you're at a climbing gym, you would get on roped routes that are at least two number grades below your limit. Uh, I would say that would be kind of a good place to shoot. Like for me, my limit, you know, really is kind of mid 513 for red pointing. So when I'm doing a, uh, a gym session that is more aerobic oriented, I'm climbing a lot of 510s and 511s, nothing over like 12A, uh, you know, I, nothing that I would fall on. Uh, and so I would do, um, uh, you know, try to do a dozen routes, you know, a dozen 60 foot lead routes, uh, steeper routes that make me recruit a lot of climbing muscles. Standing on your feet is not going to be quite, you know, very, very effective, but getting on steeper routes, you know, better holds, and kind of 
climbing to avoid pumping out. That's your goal if you want to train the aerobic energy system. You don't want to get that sizzling forearm pump. You want to kind of be at, at most an 8 out of 10 effort or a 7 or 8 out of 10 effort uh, is a good place to be. Um, another workout that I like to do here at home is I have a Concept2 rowing machine. Rowing, of course, recruits all your muscles, kind of like climbing. It's not super climbing specific, but it uses a lot of the same muscles. Um, and I have a tread wall. And so what I did for my workout today, right before Training Cafe, was I uh, do intervals where I uh, pull on the rowing machine for two minutes at, again, like a 8 out of 10 effort, like a 215 pace on the Concept2 rower. Uh, so I do two minutes on the rowing machine with my climbing shoes on. And then I go right to my tread wall and climb on big holds, um, you know, again, turning my body, pretending I'm on a steeper route at the gym, uh, but I'm on a tread wall, going nowhere, and uh, I'll climb for two minutes. And again, the effort, seven or eight out of ten, you know, I'm not grabbing any tiny holds, I'm not doing any moves that are, you know, maximal. After the two minutes on the tread wall, I'm back on the rowing machine for two minutes. After two minutes on the rowing machine, I'm back on the tread wall. And so I go back and forth a total of six times. So that's six, two minutes uh, on the rowing machine and six times two minutes on the tread wall. So combined, it's 12 minutes of each or 24 minutes. And it's all strung together with no rest. And so my heart rate gets to right around that 80% of my maximal heart rate for my age, which again is, I, I don't really want to be any higher than that or I would not be zone two anymore. But that uh, 24 minutes of steady exercise would be the climber's equivalent of a runner going out for a 24 minute run at a comfortable pace. And that workout, as I described it, where you're not getting anywhere near failure, but you're working consistently and keeping your heart rate elevated for you know, 20 minutes or more is a very good climbing specific aerobic workout that will provide the adaptations in terms of mitochondria content, it's a big one, uh, to uh, try to improve long term. And you know, I'm mostly a route climber. My goals when I return to rock in March will be to climb long, steep routes. So I need to all winter long be putting in my time, a couple of sessions a week that target the climbing specific aerobic energy system. And I do, like I said, a few runs a week. And then on top of that, I do some training for the other energy systems. So uh, that was a much longer description than I had hoped for, but I think it's some killer content. It might be worth listening to twice uh, if this is new information to you. Um, however, if you've listened to my podcasts on the topic of energy system training, which I did a series of five a couple of years ago that you can go back and find uh, in the Training for Climbing podcast, I get really deep into the details, uh, the science, the protocols, the actionable items, here I just kind of glossed over some stuff and tried to give you some uh, detail, at least to help guide you on the training of the aerobic energy system. So, uh, okay, I guess it's a good time to move on. I see a number of questions have been typed in here, um, and I'm going to try to blow through these in the next 20 minutes or so, and then we'll sign off for today. Um, uh, first up. Um, is actually a question relating to this topic. Uh, how important do you think VO2 max is for climbing rather than establishing improved cardio through aerobic style climbing training? Okay, so I, I basically just answered uh, this question uh, in the last 20 minutes of discussion. Uh, the VO2 max test, if you went and had it done on a treadmill, would not be very um, relevant to uh, your climbing ability. Sure, a higher number would mean a stronger cardiovascular system you know, generally, and perhaps a higher stroke volume and a lower resting heart rate, those would be all good things, but that's, you know, having a 70 VO2 max in that context isn't what going to make you a 515 climber. Uh, it's having, you know, maybe a 55 VO2 max that's climbing specific, you know, if we had the tread wall test to gather the data and to standardize it. Uh, okay, on to the next question. Marco says, how would you organize a power endurance session, such as four by fours and a bouldering wall, in terms of intensity, volume, rest, and progression over the weeks? Okay, great question, and that's the type of workout that I do twice a week. 
This is a, an anaerobic lactic type workout, though it does stress the aerobic energy system because it's an interval program, uh, interval protocol, and so the aerobic energy system is certainly um, not only being used somewhat while you're on the wall, but it's driving the recovery between the intervals. Uh, but if you're doing it right, it can be more lactic and really targeted to uh, improving power endurance in that anaerobic lactic reserve. So um, again, uh, you're asking for some details here in terms of intensity, volume, rest, and progression. Well, the intensity should be high, like 9 out of 10 effort uh, with each um, repetition on the wall that you're doing a 4 by 4 uh, you know, if it's, you know, if you're not working hard, if you're not getting pumped, uh, it's obviously more aerobic than it is anaerobic. Uh, on the other hand, the selection of the boulders that you're doing, it has to be such that they don't have shutdown moves that you fall off of. Because it's hard to do a four by four workout if you're falling off after the third or fourth move on your boulders. And so it, uh, if you have a system wall and you really know uh, what routes you can select and that you can do uh, that would stress you, you know, make you work hard but not like have a shutdown move or body position or a tweaky little finger or something like that, you, that's, that's not what you're after when you're doing this type of training. Uh, that's, that's limit bouldering. Uh, you know, when you're doing these 4 by 4s you want to um, kind of pursue failure to some degree uh, of the lactic system. You know, and so the, the four by four protocol would be taking a boulder. Um, so let's say, I'm just gonna make some numbers up here. Let, let's say your max boulder, your limit boulder is V10 or V9 or something like that. Uh, then probably, you know, if there's a V5 that you know, uh, somewhere in that grade range, maybe six, uh, that you can do that doesn't have a shutdown move or a tweaky hold. Uh, you know, one that you could probably climb a few times repeatedly uh, and it would be hard, but you wouldn't fall off due to failure. That would be a good kind of boulder to pick. And so your four by four would be doing four boulders four times. And so you would pick that first boulder, that V6, and you would, you would climb it once. Let's say it takes 45 seconds to go up. You would come down and you would rest about that same amount, 45 seconds. And then you would climb that same boulder again, so you'd be back on the wall for 45 seconds of effort, and then you'd come down and it would be 45 seconds of rest. And you would do that four times in a row. And so, of course, with each repetition, you're accumulating fatigue. The recovery in the 45 seconds uh, on the ground is, is not complete recovery. And you want to use a stopwatch. You want to be punctual with these things. If you stretch those rests out, then you lose the effectiveness of the protocol. Um, you could, if you you know, had a huge selection of boulders, you could do four different boulders of similar grade, one after another with, again, a rest in between that was kind of the same as your time under tension on the boulder. Uh, so if the boulder takes 30 seconds, you rest 30 seconds. Um, so, but you're doing these in groups of four, and you fire through them very strict on your times. Uh, and so by the fourth rep of that group, the fourth boulder of that group, uh, or the fourth go on that boulder of that group, you should be pretty pumped. Your lactic system should be fairly drained and you will be acidic. That is when you take your longer rest. It could be five minutes, it could be 10 minutes. It's gonna really depend on how much time you have available. Uh, and of course, do a thorough warm up so that when you start this protocol, you're really tuned up and turned on and ready to go. Uh, after that, longer rest of five or ten minutes, you do the next group of four boulders. It could be another boulder repeated four times. Uh, maybe it's a V5 that you climb four times uh, following that exact protocol of equal rest to climbing time. And then after that second group of four, you, you go another five to ten minutes of rest. If the rest breaks are longer, well then you can probably pick harder boulders and uh, that elicit a higher intensity. But as you go through from the first to the second to the third to the fourth group, you are accumulating session fatigue um, and your anaerobic reserve, um, for instance, the glycogen that is stored in your muscle cells may become depleted. Um, and so you might notice a power drop off 
in that third and fourth set where despite a five or 10 minute rest uh, between the groups of bowlers, you might be on a V, you might have to do a V4 on, on set um, three and you might need to do four goes on a V3 for the last set of the four by four, the last group of four reps. Uh, so that is where you have to kind of be um, knowledgeable, you know, reading your body uh, and picking the appropriate routes uh, and, you know, every gym's a little different on how good the wall is. I mean, a spray wall would be perhaps even better than a, a climbing set boulders because then on the spray wall, you could get on and climb for 30 or 40 seconds and select the holds so that you are working hard but not failing. And then you step off and rest the 30 or 40 seconds, and then you're back on the spray wall. And again, select a different, you, you could just self-select your boulders at that point, make them up as you go. Again, avoiding moves that you can't do, um, you know, that you would maybe fall off on because of a weird body position or a lunge or something. You want to be climbing steadily, hard, near 90% effort, you know, by the end of each boulder, you should feel like you really worked hard. Um, and uh, that one sure that you have a fairly lactic workout. That's pretty much what I do on my tread wall when I'm doing like this evening. I'm going to do a longer aerobic, uh, anaerobic lactic session. Instead of four by fours, I'm going to do one minute all out on the tread wall with a 20 pound weight belt on. And then I'm going to rest four minutes. And I'll repeat that like six times and it'll be a hell of a workout. That's a, another lactic protocol that you could use that uh, stresses the lactic system. Uh, more severely, but with fewer reps and slightly longer duration. So th I have a, a number of different protocols that I put different climbers on depending on what their needs are. And so I'll leave it at that. Hopefully there's enough there for you to cut through Marco and uh, you know, employ. Okay, on we go to Michael, the vegan climber. Hey coach, uh, headed over the pond to Rocky Mountain National Park this summer for a bouldering trip. I'm a V10 climber wondering what you would plan, uh, what you would plan a training plan for that trip? Well, first of all, um, you want to be, uh, even though you're going bouldering and you might only be doing 20 or 30 second long boulders, you're likely going to be at 10,000 feet elevation, you know, for a lot of your bouldering uh, up in the park here. Very, very high up. Uh, at 10,000 feet, you uh, uh, have um, something like only 70% of the oxygen you would have at sea level. So let's say you live in uh, Europe, um, in London, let's say, where you're virtually at sea level, uh, you're gonna get there and it's gonna be a shock to the system when you're trying to boulder up at 10,000 feet. Now, your body will make red blood cells and over the course of a couple of weeks, you will have more red blood cells to work with. But the more aerobically fit you are, you know, that generalized system, uh, that would help you out. And uh, of course, once you get up there, fueling yourself appropriately would help a lot. Getting a lot of sleep so you can make red blood cells would help a lot. Um, and making every effort count and not taking days that you uh, really you know, destroy yourself up there, really investing your energy wisely. But in terms of training, I mean, it, it, it's, if it, you're just going on a bouldering shift, well then obviously you wanna do, um, you know, couple limit boulder sessions per week. I imagine you're doing that in the gym or outside, depending where you live. Um, I would do two lactic sessions per week. Um, and I would do at least maybe one aerobic, climbing specific aerobic session and go running a couple days a week uh, in terms of preparing yourself for the altitude. Though the, the running, as I just discussed, won't have much impact on climbing short boulders, but in this situation of being at uh, elevation, it could make a real difference. Okay, next question, uh, Sam, I'm planning to climb outdoors this season, so would uh, have time for a mesocycle training. So I won't have time for mesocycle training. Um, I'm planning two days strength, one day aerobic uh, with some antagonist training. That's good, I like that, kind of putting those together. Uh, and uh, one day power endurance at the gym. Uh, so this is, you know, a daily undulating periodization program, DUP as I call it uh, in my books and podcasts. Uh, and it's pretty much what I do, you know, a DUP where I'm training all the energy systems, trying to uh, not take one energy system to sky high levels. Uh, that's not possible at my age. And for many climbers, if they've been training and climbing a long time, there's only little gains to be had. 
uh, it's more about keeping all the energy systems up and seeking little tiny gains. And so this type of program isn't too bad. You know, the two strength days could get you some strength gains. The one power endurance and one aerobic session would maintain those energy systems, perhaps. They certainly won't give you any gains. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I guess if you're, um, uh, if you've got a 12-week block here to train, maybe the first half of the block, I would maybe consider doing a third strength session a week. Uh, and then as you get to the second half of the block, um, I would uh, probably switch to um, just one or two strength days and then maybe go to two or three lactic days uh, to, you know, you always want to try to train that energy system last because those adaptations are more short-term um, and you can spin them up more quickly. Uh, before a trip, and um, and then doing just some you know uh, aerobic system and antagonist training as you can fit in to kind of round it out. So hopefully that helps you out. Uh, on to the next question um, from Fred. Um, have to get back to work. Oh, okay. So he's going to look at the video when he's done. Uh, he says, "I recently purchased training for climbing, my best-selling book. Thank you." And uh, since everybody rec recommended it, I'm psyched to read it and help uh, me improve and climb harder. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an encyclopedia, that book, uh, because it covers all the critical topics uh, to significant depth. Um, I need to do another update in a few years. I've done a new edition of that book basically every eight years to kind of get the new science in there. And uh, this current edition came out, I believe, in 2017 or something like that. Um, and the Spanish, the new tra Spanish translation uh, about that same time. And uh, so a couple more years, I may do another uh, edition of uh, Training for Climbing. Keep it fresh and uh, on point. Uh, okay, um, next question. Hi, Coach. Uh, should I use Endurex only for sending days or also for days when I'm training endurance and PE? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I mean, if... Um, if if the cost of the product is a factor, and it's not an expensive product, you know, a jar is around forty dollars or forty euros, uh, and so that gets you, um, uh, you know, it's a one month supply if you used it every day. So it could be a three month supply if you just used it on your climbing days. Uh, but I recommend if you're really serious about training and climbing, it is a valuable supplement to consume pre workout and pre climb because. It primes that aerobic energy system. It improves your circulation. It um, helps mitochondria function. You know, it kind of helps maximize for what you have your oxidative, uh, uh, you know, capabilities. And um, helps you recover faster between reps, between routes, between boulders. And so myself and most of the pros and a lot of the recreational climbers that use our products uh, do put a, a scoop and a half into a liter water bottle that they consume during their um, warm up at the gym or their first hour at the gym uh, and they or they consume that scoop or two in a water bottle during the first half of their climbing day if they're outside for a long day because uh, the active ingredients the beetroot extract and the citrulline malate they give kind of an arc of effect that uh, you know peaks about two hours after you consume it and then hangs on for another couple of hours after that so you get kind of a four hour enhancement of your aerobic energy system that can be quite valuable both in the context of a long training session or a session of outdoor climbing. And I should add that unlike non-climbing pre-workouts, if you buy what the muscle heads buy, uh, our product has no caffeine, no beta alanine. You're not going to get any of those side effects that bother people like the buzz of caffeine. Uh, if there's too much, you know, you can get jittery uh, that can be counterproductive. Caffeine in high doses is actually a vasoconstrictor, so it shuts down blood flow, so it would harm endurance in very, very high doses. Uh, and the uh, beta alanine, which if you take it every single day, can have an ergogenic effect for climbing uh, in just acute doses. Right when you go to the gym, all it does is make you tingly. It has no performance enhancing effect, so it's kind of a wasted ingredient that uh, companies put in just so that you feel something. Um, again, caffeine in smaller doses can be uh, ergogenic. Every climber is different, though, depending on your genetics and how caffeine adapted you are. So I am against putting it into the drinks and using caffeine, either consuming it as coffee because you're used to how you react to that, or in a little 
um, 100 milligram tablets or capsules is a way that you can experiment and regulate exactly what you're getting when it comes to caffeine. And just throwing it into a, a drink in high doses like the C4 pre-workout does, I think it's a bad thing for climbers. Um, Next question, uh, can you comment on the supplemental use of glucosamine and chondroitin for joint and tendon health? Um, is it uh, a benefit in addition to collagen supplementation? Um, it, it acts in a different way. Um, I think the um, research, the latest uh, that I've viewed, and I, I've used that supplement for the last decade, and I still consume it, uh, you know, a couple tablets a day. Uh, I, I think it's the glucosamine, and uh, some companies make it with MSM in it, and that's my preference. If you can find the glucosamine with MSM, I, I think those two together are more effective than the glucosamine and chondroitin. Uh, they will, uh, if they have any effect for you, it'll be with regard to the joint health and pain, cartilage perhaps uh, becoming a little uh, less painful, um, you know, People that are arthritic, older athletes, I think it can be beneficial for. Uh, when it comes to tendons and ligaments, I don't think there's any benefit whatsoever. Uh, that's never been proven. It's a, it's a joint supplement. You want to think of it that way um, and not as a connective tissue supplement. Collagen, on the other hand, the research is getting more impressive with every, pass of year, uh, every passing year. There's been a couple of new papers that have come out just in the last 12 months. Uh, that have uh, shown in really well-designed studies the benefits. Uh, one, one of those studies was uh, looking at the healing of um, an ACL repair uh, being accelerated with uh, the use of um, hydrolyzed collagen uh, that's vitamin C enriched combined with the rehab uh, of the uh, ACL. Um, and there are a number of other studies that show reductions in joint pain uh, and uh, improved collagen synthesis with a daily consumption of um, a high-quality vitamin C enriched collagen product. Of course, supercharged collagen made by my brand, Fizzy Vantage. Uh, it's the only climbing-specific product out there, and uh, it, you know, it's been on the market for over four years now, and uh, most climbers, I would say 95% who try it, rave uh, on the effects of consuming it daily. If you just take it once in a while, it won't have any noticeable impact. But uh, as a daily use, uh, many climbers do discover uh, they're less tweaky feeling. Uh, it's certainly helpful in recovering from injury. Um, and just for general joint and tendon pain and uh, health, uh, consuming it daily is helpful. And uh, you know, before my morning workout, I had a scoop and a half into a glass of water with uh, the Adurex. I mix those two together into a stack, a pre-workout stack, and consume it uh, during my warm-up for my workout, and then it's fully circulating, and I'm uh, benefiting from both um, supplements during my training for climbing workout. And I do the same thing when I'm heading to the crag. I mix them together, uh, you know, two scoops of collagen, a scoop and a half of the Endurex into a one or one and a half liter bottle, and then I consume that the first hour or two that I'm there, and it kind of gets into my system what I need to uh, do my best and hopefully perform my best. Okay, well, I think I've reached the end of the questions here. Uh, I see a greetings from France, so thank you, Omar. I really appreciate that. Um, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed this episode, uh, about 48 minutes in running here. Um, I'm going to try to get back into the groove here of doing these every other Monday the past few months with the holidays and with my fall travel and climbing, it was tough to, to do them so regularly, but I'm going to try to get back in the groove. And so spread the word to your friends, your climbing partners about Training Cafe. If they have a question to ask, uh, they can hopefully join us live for an episode sometime soon. And uh, I guess I just want to wrap things up by wishing you a happy new year. I hope you're having some uh, good winter climbing or winter indoor training as I am right now and uh, anticipating a great spring season and a great uh, 2023 uh, in climbing and beyond. Well, that does it for this episode of The Trading Cafe. Until next time, be safe, be strong, climb on.